Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening, good afternoon. If you are on the West Coast, it's around the noon, I believe. Uh, it's nine uh, o'clock, uh, nine hours uh, difference. So we will wait a bit, you know, before uh, you will, uh, uh, you know, uh, be able to connect uh, and we will see you. If you can, because we are streaming today on LinkedIn and on Face, uh, sorry, on YouTube. If you can put in comments that you can hear us and everything is okay, and I'll still check it on my phone. Uh, we can see now comments from LinkedIn uh, and YouTube, but I will still check on my phone if everything is okay. Uh, that would be good. Uh, yeah, there are some people already here. Uh, it's like a couple of people. Yeah, there are you, you know, people are appearing already on you know LinkedIn and on Facebook. So if you can, uh, we can hear you, Antonín Předota. Uh, perfect. Uh, it's very good. Uh, okay. There's like uh, on my phone around 20 people at LinkedIn. So let's wait a bit, you know, more. Okay, Petra. Uh, there's a, on Eduard Barça. I'm, you know, best regards to Switzerland. Eduard is from Switzerland. Jan, uh, uh, yeah, all, all the best. Uh, so, uh, so maybe we can start because I, I I don't think that it's up to date you know here in uh, uh, Streamyard, but I have uh, you know numbers and everything on my phone. So today' theme is inspirational leadership, and again I have a you know dear friend with me, uh, Richard Macklin, who is the uh, vice chair, global vice chair at the biggest law firm in the world, Dentons. I'm Jan Milfeit. I'm former Microsoft chairman for Europe. And now I coach uh, people like Richard, <laughs> not Richard directly, but I mean people on that level. I do executive coaching. I'm also mental coach of the Czech Olympic Games uh, top team. And I coach even, you know, kids. I wrote two books. And in fact, from one of my books, from the positive leader, I will use some ideas. So, Richard, the floor is yours now on uh, 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 you know, inspirational leadership, and then I will continue. So you can. All right. Start. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, folks, for joining us. So today in our series, we're moving uh, on to inspirational leadership. We're talking about from motivation to inspiration, and we're going to talk about why is that so important right now. It was already important, but what's happening now, we think, is accelerating that need for change. We're going to talk a little bit about what does it look like and then finally how do we achieve it that's the bit i'm going to do for about 10 minutes and then i'm going to hand over to Jan to do the brainy stuff on what's actually going on in here as usual <laughs> okay so let's talk about why it's important inspirational leadership as opposed to motivational leadership and there's lots and lots of research out there that suggests by and large I and mean, i've looked at a lot of the studies but if you average it down uh, those teams who are inspired tend to be twice as productive as a result of being inspired in the flow, as Jan would say, rather than simply being motivated. And if you think about that in business terms, just pause and think that's massive. And that's based on a lot of studies by people like Harvard and Bain and Co and others that we've, we've looked at. But quite apart from raising the share price, there's lots of other indirect benefits that are possibly larger that arise out of people uh, being uh, happier by being inspired. You know, it saves on recruitment fees. They're more, they're more sticky. Yeah, it Absolutely. reduces politics in the office, which is a massive cost and drain and negative force. Actually, not measured enough in the workplace, um, and your people become your marketing. Uh, uh, tool because they become advocates of your business because they love what they're doing and why they're doing it. So all of those things add up to why inspirational leadership have re has real value, both in monetary terms, but of course in human terms too. And as Jan always teaches us, motivation leads to um, success in material terms but inspiration leads to happiness in emotional terms. And as Jan always tells us, don't forget folks, I know you read it, but he always tells us, and it's true, that happiness leads to success, 
it is not the other way around. And that is the most important thing to take away from this because it's all based on inspirational leadership that takes you there. It's the pa about the power of focusing on strengths rather than trying to fix weaknesses. And we've talked about this in previous sessions and Jan's gonna talk about it more uh, in a minute. The other lovely thing about uh, inspiration is it's infectious, yeah? Upwards, downwards, sideways. If I'm inspiring to my team, they inspire me back by being in the flow and excited and they inspire their peers, which is a wonderful thing. It's a very positive energy and it's much more effective and I might say cheaper than paying people bonuses, yeah? There are other things in life than money. It's important, but there are other things. And what we'd say about motivation is although it has its place, of course, in leadership, it can be a negative force because it reduces or it can reduce, especially if it's in financial terms, the motivation, reduce engagement and reduce the relationship between boss and team to one of quid pro quo, a contract. You do this and I'll do that. You do this and I'll do that. That's not the same as me wanting just to do it because I'm so excited, yeah? And that's the difference that we're talking about today. And what's interesting is, you know, people aren't by and large coin operated. Now, if you'd asked me when I was in my twenties and thirties, what did I want out of the leaders that I was working with? I'll be honest, I'd have said more money. I would have said it, yeah? But now that I'm very, very old and looking back, what I realize is I was very lucky, very fortunate to have been inspired along the way and to be in the flow most of my career, been very, very lucky. And because of that, looking back, if I'd had my time again, I would have said, I'd like to be fulfilled by being inspired by the people I work with. It just happened that I was lucky to do that. So people sometimes unconsciously, they're not aware of the fact that actually inspiration is what they need more than motivation until it happens to them. Now, why is inspirational leadership more important than ever before? Two reasons. Number one, we talked about it last time, remote working, yeah? We need to replace that face-to-face -face contact and warmth that we're used to by talking to people in the lifts and the corridors and everything else we do with some emotion. We have to up the emotion through this remote way of working. We have to engage with people and grab them by the heart and inspire them find their passion. So it never became more important. As we said also many times before, it ain't going back to exactly how it was before. There's gonna be a lot more remoteness in the way we work and therefore we need a lot more emotional connection. So that's one reason. The second reason, again, we've talked about it before, is Generation Z, Gen Z, okay? As we talked about, it's their turn next at the wheel. We should celebrate that because many of the qualities they have are exactly what we need in this new world. Gen Z is not hierarchical. Gen Z does not recognize respect. It has to be earned, and even if it's earned, it's, it's lost its currency um, respect. It's much more about the experience than it is about ownership. And experience is emotion. It's about how you feel. And inspiration when you're inspired is you feel great. You're in the flow, okay? And that's why we think it's ever so important for us to learn to move across to being inspiring to our teams. So there's lots of opportunity out there because the research that we looked at says that less than half of employees out there right now uh, consider their leaders to be inspiring. So bags of opportunity. All right, so that's why it matters. Moving swiftly on, um, what does it actually look like? Well, it's not about being nice, or let me put another, it's not only about just being nice, okay? Um, I have a, it, one of the questions that my bank asks for security, apart from my date of birth and my mother's maiden name and all that stuff is, um, who was your favorite teacher at school? 
And I remember them asking you, me, They are like, usually asking about the dog or, you know, cat or whatever the name or the teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> you're going to have to change all your answers and questions now. You realize that you're, you're, you're on yeah. YouTube. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, so I won't give the name of my favorite teacher. But when they asked me that, it was actually very, very easy immediately for me to think of who it was. And he is indeed the answer to my security question, folks. Um, and I thought about it, why was that? And it was because one, he was passionate. He really, really genuinely wanted us idiot schoolboys to enjoy the subject. It was English literature, folks. That was a tough call as much as he did. And even more than that, and this is interesting, he wanted every kid in the class to enjoy it as much as he did, regardless of their ability. Or to put it in Jan's terms, regardless of their strengths. He just wanted to make the most of everybody's strengths to engage them as much as he was. And it was totally genuine. And those lessons were the only ones I never watched. And none of us watched the clock. We were just totally in the flow. We honestly never watched the clock because it was such great fun with him. Yeah. The other thing he did, number two, is he listened. So if we didn't understand or if we thought what he was saying was soppy rubbish, we'd talk to him about it and we'd have a discussion. And we'd then he'd step back and listen to what we said and perhaps adjust his view. And we and we were we felt bought into the analysis of what we were reading, which was a wonderful thing. We felt incited, uh, excited bought in in business terms and therefore inspired which we were and then the third thing which was very interesting right my english teacher whose name i can't divulge otherwise you'll have access to my bank account <laughs> he was a smoker and he would 15 minutes through to the lesson he'd go out and have a cigarette and he'd leave us for 10 minutes while he had that cigarette and he'd come back in and we were good as gold. And the reason is he knew he could trust us. He knew he didn't have to control us because he knew he got us in the flow and we were excited and just wanted to do it. He was unfe unfettered, if you like, by cultural weakening um, routines. And so once we were in the flow, we were basically self-actualizing, something that Jan will talk about. And um, my English teacher had never heard of Maslow's pyramid, right? But <laughs> that's basically what he was doing to us. But he was a practitioner, you know. Yes, he built it, right, without yeah, knowing. Absolutely, absolutely. And last time, you know, we talked about this and we talked about the fact that in this new COVID world, post-COVID world, employers, leaders must, they have to, and I think it's a very, very good thing, so it's, yeah, they must trust less, uh, trust more and control less. Yeah. And that's a wonderful, if you can get people in the flow, why would you need to control them? Yeah. So that's something he did. And he was truly an inspirational leader. God bless him. Right. So that's what it feels like. Second and final example is what about those sickening people who say, do something you love and you'll never do a day's work in your life. Don't you hate them? They're always rich, aren't they? They always are able to say that because they were either born rich or got lucky. Or maybe that's not right. Maybe actually they made their own luck. Maybe they had a vision, you know? Maybe they pursued that vision with passion. And maybe they delivered or they had their team deliver that vision because they were listened to by him or her, yeah? So maybe they were right when they said, do something you love and you'll never do a day's work. And I'll give you just a very, very quick example indeed. Um, <clears throat> I have a very dear friend, Jay. I don't know if you're on Jay listening, Jay Connolly. He's our head of, global head of, uh, talent a very very talented and wonderful man and uh i once wrote with a friend uh our ceo at work a strategy uh for the firm and we spent weeks on this thing we built 
fabulous PowerPoint and we had animation and colors and music and God knows what. And we thought, me and Jeremy, this is just brilliant. We just can't wait to tell the troops about this. They're going to love it. So we asked Jay, my friend, who was head of uh, HR, to be our practice audience. So I said, Jay, can we just practice this on you, you know, just to see if it's going to land well with, with everybody? He said, yeah, sure. And I will never forget it. So we do it, me and Jeremy, to Jay. And we do all the showbiz and the lights and the animation and the this and that. And we just, we think we're utterly brilliant. And we get to the end of it. And we say to him, so Jay, what do you think? How is that? Now, what Jay was supposed to say at that point was, brilliant guys, change nothing. <laughs> Which is what we were expecting. What he actually said was, hmm, uh, so who did you consult with in order to get buy-in for this strategy to work? And we went, what? <laughs> it had never occurred to us that we actually might need to listen and bring people on board in order to inspire them to be part of the project. And that was a huge failure on our part. And it's taking, taken me most of the time since Jay did that to us to learn to do it slightly differently. I haven't got there yet, but we're getting there. So that was a very, very helpful lesson. Right, final point, folks. We've done the why do it, we've done the what does it look like. Now let's very quickly do the how do we actually achieve inspirational leadership. And basically, it's just a move from the material to the emotional, yeah? Motivation to inspiration, from being, as we've said before, a boss to becoming a coach. From talking less about forecasts, are more about vision, yeah? Less about ownership, more about experience, et cetera. And also some of the st uh, studies we've looked at, this is another one, Bain and Co did a very good study on this, saying, proving very interestingly that inspirational leadership can be learned, which is quite interesting. Um, and they give a lovely example in their study. Um, you know, the Edison thing about geniuses, 99 or 1% inspiration, 99% ins, uh, perspiration. Yeah. And they flip it the other way around, which I love. And they say to build a company that employees love, it's actually 1% perspiration and 99% inspiration, which you'd think would be easy because it's less perspiration, but actually inspiration is a whole study in itself. But I love that way that they, they flip that around. So very importantly, inspiration has to be real. It has to be, you cannot fake passion. We all know that, right? Give you one more very quick example. There was a, a, a bank that I used to work for. I, I can mention this by name because it's public. It's called Virgin Money. They merged with another company called Ver, uh, Northern Rock. I went around to see them very quickly after they'd, uh, after they'd merged. And I was blown away with the culture that they had created so quickly there. They had a very, very inspirational leader, Jane Angadia at the time. And I and, and they had this mission strap line called EBO, everyone's better off, which is very clever because it talks about the stakeholder, the customer and the people in the business, everyone's better off. And what I noticed walking around the building was everybody in the building, every meeting we went into, they're saying, well, is it EBO? Is it not EBO? Yeah, it's EBO, let's do it. Or no. They were really living their values. And I said to the CEO, how did you do that? Because we'd actually just done a big merger and I really wanted to know how they did this. How did you glue that culture together? What agency did you use? And she was horrified. She's an inspirational leader. She said, what are you talking about? We went out, we listened to the people, we engaged them, we asked them, they built it. And because they built and came up, there were several thousand people in this building, they engaged with all of them. They reduced it down to everyone's better off. And it's a business that works magnificently. And it's one of the most inspirational leadership lessons um, I've ever had. Well done, Jane Ann. Okay, so you can't fake it. Another thing, nearly there, folks. 
You say, don't you, or we say, you get the behavior you reward. And something else that the brilliant Jay taught me is, it's not just about reward, it's about recognition, which is different from reward. Yeah, reward is one form of recognition, but there are a million ways of recognizing people. It can be calling them out, it can be celebrating their success, it can be doing all sorts of things that don't just involve the coin operated solution. And I would say in reality, you get the financial performance that you reward financially, but you get the inspirational behavior that you lead inspirationally. And that's a very important lesson for us to take away, given what we said earlier about, you know, motivation can be quite a quid pro quo contractual negative thing. Yeah. So there's a difference between reward and recognition. OK, so how do you do that? Well, there's lots of talk about vision and passion and purpose and values. But honestly, do we practice it? We do lots in businesses, don't we, about talking about values and talking about cultural starting. But as ever, it's the difference between knowing it and doing it. And so often in businesses, we talk about values, we read the books, we do all the stuff they tell us to do. And then what do we do? We say, well, what was your financial performance? Okay, we'll give you a bonus. And that's where it falls short for us. Because if you're gonna measure those things with a 360, which is a great thing to do, and you ask the end user, the employees or the team people above you, beside you, how they feel, right? That's when you start to get to inspiration, as long as you apply what they are telling you, yeah, what they're telling us about how do they feel about being led, okay? So it's not only asking how people feel, but it's doing something that recognizes for the person who's being assessed what that result is. I think that sounds really simple. I think very, very few businesses actually do it. Okay, final point. It's really, really simple. It's really just about vision and strengths. So, you know, to be an inspirational leader, we need to get a vision and then we need to feel some passion about it. And then we need to give our teams control. Yeah. We need to listen to them and we need to focus, as Jan always tells us, on their strengths and not fixate or try to fix their weaknesses. And I really think it's pretty simple in its formula. It's just that we're not very good at applying it. Okay, that's me done. Over to the professor who's gonna say what's really going on in our brains again. <laughs> you you put bar very high, my friend. Uh, <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, let's first ask a rhetorical question. Who is inspirational leader in my view? Those people and both me and Richard, we are like 60 years of the corporate experience in the global economy. We are running different sides of the organizations. So we have a lot of experience from inspirational leaders, non-inspirational leaders, or, you know, very bad leaders, right? So in my view, inspirational leader, first of all, he or she needs to understand perfectly who he or she is. Okay, that's number one to really be self-aware, okay? That's number one. Number two, they, they need to know what is the meaning of my team, what is the meaning of my own organization, what is the mission, basically, okay? Mm -hmm. And number three, they are able to make decisions so they are able to inspire people so they can use, to link it, what Richard said, they can use best of them, all people, they can use best strengths, all talents, you know, who they are, in order to fulfill the mission, you know, right? Basically, this is it, okay? There are not that many inspirational leaders in the world. Why? We are not teaching self-awareness at all in the mm. schools. And I'm mm. today involved with places like in SAT, Imperial College. I do lessons, you know, uh, 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 you know, over the sea, at, uh, you know, uh, Stanford, Harvard, or MIT. Those are all great schools. They starting to do more and more, I would say, emotional intelligence, but I don't think it's enough because really in, inspiration as such is basically the engine. Today, 
we are celebrating 80 years since the speech of General de Gaulle. As you know, he was at that time in London. There is a house, it's called French House, where he prepared a speech. What de Gaulle was, he really, he was a soldier, so he really understood very well, personally, who he was, okay? Mm -hmm. He understood what is the mission to free up, you know, France, you know, right, from the, from the German hands. And number three, he was able to inspire people, you know, step by step. First, mm -hmm. it was a small group, but then suddenly, and I don't know, forgive me, but I don't know the name of the organization, but that, you know, uh, Freedom Army or whatever, it was like, 100,000 people suddenly organized, you know, around this mission, right? So it was a heroic. If you listen, I, during the COVID, I have heard zero, zero inspirational speeches from the politicians, zero. Mm. The only inspirational speech I have heard was from the British Queen. Mm. She's over 90 years old and she did a great job when she spoke about, you know, what is happening. And she made a lot of meaning around it, what is happening. She linked it to some, you know, song uh, after the Second World War or whatever, you know, right? So th that was fantastic. And the problem is that we are teaching today leaders, but also overall population, only things which are around you. But we are not teaching people what is inside of us. We are teaching mm. ignorance, basically, emotional ignorance. Daniel <laughs> Goldman, in 95, in 95, Bill Gates put me in some special program. It was, it was called Bench, okay, a couple of people. And we had the trainings with the different people and we were studying different people and so on. Daniel Goldman, there was some conference and that conference, he said, that if you look at the successful organizations, 95, ladies and gentlemen, he said, 20% is IQ, what we are teaching in the schools. 80% is the EQ, emotional intelligence, which at that time was not taught in the schools at all. Now is the year 2020, and I listen to Daniel Goldman again, because I'm a fellow at the Harvard Coaching Institute, and Daniel Goldman said it's only 7% about traditional intelligence, the overall mm. success, and 93% about emotional intelligence. We are still not teaching emotional intelligence as such, mm. you know, right? Mm. And, and, mm. I, and I think this is, the, this is the real problem. Because as Richard said, we are teaching motivation. We are teaching scorecards. You know, we are teaching kind of the short-term results and so on, which, which is super important. Well, we are not realizing that the human happiness and inspiration is the only long-term driver of the great performance. This is it. Because as Richard said, if people are emotionally tied to the jobs, if they like what they do, mm. you don't need to be like your teacher. There's the smoker teacher. Anthony Predota is asking about the smoker teacher. He didn't need to be with you because he knew, hey, those guys, they are really right. inspired. They like what they do. And that's why. Okay. And this is it. As of today, unfortunately, according to Gallup statistics, Gallup is doing, you know, on engagement every three years, huge survey. So, uh, in fact, they uh, published the last survey, uh, you know, around the Christmas last year. Only 14% of the people are actively engaged, which means those are people, as Richard said, self-actualized, which is the peak of the, you know, Maslow pyramid. Those are people, they really love what they do. They use in their day-to-day -day jobs, their talents, and you don't need to watch them at all, okay? And they are even like disseminators of the good, you know, behavior in the organization, okay? Mm. Then there are people who are engaged, which means that they are working more or less only if there is a boss, okay? If there's no boss, you know, they looking around. And then there are around 40% people who are actively disengaged which mm. means that those are people who are like getting up in the morning, they are pissed off and they go to work with only one goal, to piss off other people. <laughs> this is it. So, I mean, it's all infection. The whole world is running on less than one fifth of the capacity. And I'm not mm. talking about financial capacity or about the results. I'm talking, mm. talking about the mental and emotional capacity. Because once you are able to inspire people, because inspiration, if you look, I mean, the, in, in the old Greece and all Rome, they knew exactly what it was. Inspiration means in spirit, which means like 
it's mm. in me i love it yeah. i'm you know attached to what i do that's a very different from motivation i mean if i have like you know for example athletes they they want to win you know golden medal at the olympic games whatever or you know somebody wants to be promoted as an executive whatever. that's that those are great goals provided they love what they do if they hate what they do and they just looking to like differentiate themselves by the money results and so on they are unhappy and it's not really good I, in my view and unfortunately there's a lot of managers and a lot of other people like that success without the happiness it's failure in my eyes mm. easy as it is mm. right mm. and unfortunately we are teaching success we are not teaching in the schools happiness okay mm. and it's tough mm. i mean it's tough mm. as you mm. as richard mm. said there's a lot of leaders who are saying oh, it's touchy feeling it's not touchy feeling i mean mm. once i changed dynamics in my team 20 years ago in central and eastern europe the team which was like average or below the average in some years for 10 years once we change it and we took basically who those people were their talents and we put it together with the job descriptions basically we said this is the job description those are your talents this is the best way how to use your talents in your job suddenly that team was four years in the row best performing team in the world to build you know a superstar team you don't have you don't need to have all superstars i have a a sweatshirt from the Czech basketball team because I work with some of those guys. Okay, they were going to China to the uh, World Championship as a clear outsider. They were underdog big time. They finished six. They were better than United States. You know why? Because of the inspiration leadership. There's an Israeli coach, and that mm -hmm. guy was able to uh, took everybody's strengths, what is best in each and every player created synergy and inspire those people and create that mood. Hey, we can beat everybody. Don't worry, you know, right? We don't need, you know, we everybody is saying what, that we are, you know, outsiders. We need to go and, you know, play at our best. We don't need, we, we don't need to, you know, uh, lose anything. And and this is it. So it's, it's, and it's the same in work. You need to have a good workers, but in or if you are able to uh, help them to understand who they are, right? They play a day best because in the flow, people are five times more productive if they are in the flow. That's number one. Mm. Number two, yeah. if they are self-actualized, if you take to Maslow pyramid, self-actualization is on very top of the of the pyramid, which means that all of those, you know, layers like you know, physiology, security, you know, the social uh, uh, ties with the other people, you know, esteem or self-esteem and, and so on. Those are all things tied to your ego, more or less, okay? If you are self-actualized, I'm not saying you 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 don't have an ego. You have still some ego, but you are less egoistic. You are much more team player than if you are not, you know, right? Because you don't compete. If you are self-actualized, like, I'm doing my best. I work with the best people. And last but not least, inspirational leaders are able to be basically create learning organization because what some leaders they try to do it was always like no we need to be now the best organization in the world now mm. now now okay mm -hmm. it's about perfectionism and perfectionism is creating fear and fear has to do a lot with the stress and it's not good for the people if you create excellence excellence is something different excellence is like we are today best organization we can be tomorrow we will be even better we go like step by step you know carol dweck she spoke about so-called growth mindset and this is about excellent mm. every day you're getting better right mm. or fixed mindset which is like immediately you are you relate you know uh, fixed to those uh, immediate results and I, I i think it doesn't matter where you are individual or organization it's still fixed mindset and it, it's not good so I mean, inspiration has a you know huge impact. If I Richard show you uh, basically my book, the Positive Leader. So in posi the Positive Leader, I wrote for only one reason: to tell people that happiness and inspiration is the only long-term competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, Shell Shell is fantastic in scenario planning, as you know, because of the all situation with oil. They are really good. And they asked big question like two years ago, big question. What does it take to be among top five organizations for 200 years? So it's a really huge thing. So if you think about it, it's probably GE, 
Shell and a couple of other organizations who are able to do it. Okay. And the only long-term competitive advantage for whatever organization, different industries, different sizes, really long-term competitive advantage is ability of that organization to learn fast. And people are learning fast okay. if they are inspired. Okay. They are learning fast, 450% faster if they are inspired and they are in the flow. Okay, so th that's why I'm a strong believer in inspiration and happiness is really long-term drive. And I spoke in that book about four P's of the positive leadership. Positive people, those are people who are like, you know, able to figure out what are their strengths and their talents. That's number one. Then positive purpose. If you have a meaning in your life, a positive meaning in your life, you can use your talents on, on that meaning. The, the third P is positive process. Those are like four energies. Again, it was already in all Greece. It was called Kalokagatia. Those energies are physical uh, energy, so body, physiology, emotional energy, mental energy, and spiritual energy. Again, if we will look what is taught today in the schools, a bit physio, uh, physical energy, no emotional energy, whatever. It's funny uh, because a friend of mine who is like 80 years old, he's a very famous you know, doctor, he, he looked in all, you know, textbooks of the, you know, uh, doctors, the people who are studying medicine, okay? Then it's like six years you need to study. And he didn't find one mm. mentioning mm. the word emotions at all, okay? Yeah. Those people who are like treating patients, you know, they are not taught how to work with mm. emotions. Terrible. And there's a bit about mental and there's like zero about spiritual energy in the in the textbooks. Okay. And the last P is about the place that once you are like, you know who you are, you have your purpose and you are using your energies in the right way. You have like your, you know, success and happiness in balance. You are living in the place when those two are in the balance. There's nothing, me and Richard, we have nothing against success. We are just saying that long-term driver for the success is happiness and inspiration right. this is right. it and it will and it will be clear now after, after COVID. i mean we said it uh, last time after COVID, there will be huge debt uh, worldwide uh, what yeah. will be less global and there will be more digitalization you know right and so and if you want to even like as richard mentioned if you wanted to work more online with the people you don't you know you don't see each other face to face you need to be inspirational, definitely, you know, right? And I, it was funny because uh, Bill Gates was for sure inspiration. He was a good manager. He was a good businessman. He was exceptional, visionary, inspirational leader. Give you one, one uh, experience. We were sitting with the old Polish government 2004 in Warsaw, okay? And Bill Gates finished his speech like 45 minutes. Mr. Bielka, who was the prime minister at the time, he came to me and said, Jan, I'm buying all of those products Bill Gates was talking about. I said, but Mr. Prime Minister, those products are not existing today. It was just the vision. And then, <laughs> then I understood, Richard and ladies and gentlemen, what is the vision? Vision is the picture of the world which does not exist yet. And if you have mm. a communication skills and inspirational leadership skills, you are able to persuade people so mm -hmm. they start to believe in what you believe. And then you can move the crowd. Where is Charles de Gaulle? Where is Gandhi? Where is Steve Jobs? Where is, you know, Bill Gates and so on? This is it, you know. Inspirational leaders, they have a vision and they move people through that vision. I mean, you may ask, where is this vision coming from and where is the leader coming from? Imagine million years ago, you know, back in the history, people were like hunting. They were living in some forest somewhere, okay? But suddenly, there were no animals there anymore, okay? Then there was somebody, let's call him Joe. And Joe said, guys, I have a vision. We need to move to the next forest. There is a lot of animals. And if the people started to believe what Joe believed, it, Joe was called leader because he was leading people, and they were following his vision, even though at that time it was not true yet, you know, right? Whether it's uh, true or not, but they believe in that vision, and this is it. And the other thing, what I realized, mm. that inspirational leaders are moving, or in general, teams, organizations are moving, and people in general, 
for two reasons, pain or pleasure. And mm. the best leaders, they connect both. Charles de Gaulle, he, in his speech, if you study the speech, he connected pain. We, it's very painful because our country is in the hands of Germans and obviously the whole history and everything. It's very painful. But we, we, if we will work together and very hard, you know, it will be pleasure. We will be free and so on. The same Churchill, you know, Churchill also said, well, mm. there will be a lot of, you know, efforts now, but then, you know, we will be free. So if you, you know, connect it somehow, uh, people uh, will move, right? And now uh, let's talk a bit how, because uh, Richard started how, uh, what you can do as an inspirational leader. Number one, I think you need to understand who you are. Then you can understand other people. And you need to find what is best in the other people. You need to be aware of their weaknesses, for sure. But it should not be like that. It's all bullshit if, if the leaders are saying, you know, you know what? You should keep your strengths and talents. It's great who you are. But please, 90% work your own weaknesses. Guys, it doesn't, it's bullshit. It doesn't work like that. Because what is happening in your brain? Those talents and those skills, which are, you know, represented in your brain by synapses, which are connecting neurons, are getting disconnected. If you will not train that, uh, uh, you know, talent, you will mm. lose that skill. Skill uh, equals basically talent multiplied by your efforts. And you need to repeat, you know, that uh, mm. effort in order to keep that skill because other, talent is still the same but talent is genes talent is potential okay mm. for example i have a my friend of my cardiochirurgist uh, jan Pirk, he's saying if i would not do surgery for six 12 months I, my my performance would go down immediately mm. right mm. so we need to train so you need to spend like 90 percent uh, you know, using your strengths and maybe 10% your weaknesses or whatever. But if that leader is good, that leader is able to create synergy. So my strengths will cover richer weaknesses and the other way around. You know what I mean, right? The other way around. That creates team bounds, basically. It's the same in soccer, whatever. Give you one example. Czech Republic soccer team was playing a football team. Uh, let's We are in the Europe, so we can say football in America. It's obviously, you know, confusing. We can say football. In the first match, Czech Republic lost in Wembley 5-0 to England. Okay. Second match in Prague, they won 2-1. Because I think that was the inspiration leadership. And basically, Jaromir Shilhavi, who is the coach, he really built a lot of synergy, you know, in that team, right? Those are, they were not better players than, than uh, you know, England. Mm -hmm. But they really play as a team and it was, it was good. So, Second time, he or she creates synergy. And third piece, and we talk about that, inspires through the vision. Okay, so inspires through the vision. That's what is moving, you know, uh, organization. So net-net, before we will open for the questions, motivation is important, but it's not sufficient, you know, right? Because mm -hmm. unless you have a clear meaning in your organization, why you do what you do, Simon Sinek is talking in his, in his book, uh, mm. why, basically, right? Mm. That you need to have that why, that meaning. Because if you don't have a meaning, you will not create emotional connection. If it's your meaning. Uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived like five Nazi camps, you know, it was a Jewish psychiatrist. He is saying in his book, The Man's Search for Meaning, if you have a meaning in your life, you can survive everything pretty much, mm. right? Meaning is really very, you know, and if you have a tight connection to that meaning, and it's the same with the team. So what net net motivation is important, but it's not sufficient. And that's why I think it's a time, you know, to really start to teach inspiration, beginning in the schools, obviously. Because you know, if if the MBAs are not teaching inspiration, I mean how uh, how you can have inspirational leaders in the in the companies, right? Because they are almost everybody's MBA today. Right? We need to start. Uh, we need to start from there. And then uh, Richard show uh, what was fantastic. He used like two three stories from his practice from his life. Stories are creating the bounds, and stories is the way how we learn also. Because if if mm. there's a story, you can put a lot of facts in the story, uh, right? 
and people understand and like it, you know, much more. So that's another aspect of inspiration leadership. Inspiration leaders are storytellers. Okay. They are able to tell inspirational yeah. stories. And yeah. last point to not forget, you don't need always to tell that story on your own. Give you one example. In 2002, my team at the time, I was a you know VP for EMEA, responsible for Central and Eastern Europe. My team was telling me we cannot grow anymore in that fast like you want because the economy is not growing enough. All of that, like, you know, right? And I said, well, you know what? I can inspire them, but, you know, it will not be the same like somebody else. So I said, let's invite somebody who made something absolutely crazy at that point. And that was uh, uh, Reinhold Messner, who did first mm -hmm. time uh, Mount Everest without the oxygen mm -hmm. bomb, mountaineer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. after two hours, he said, like, well, I talked to nine, ten doctors, and nine out of the ten said, I'm not going to survive that experience. And he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that two, th those two hours absolutely changed mindset of my people. Somebody said in the first row, whatever we can imagine, we can achieve. And this is it. Okay, yeah. so then, like, Listen. when we achieve half billion, it was Mont Blanc, one billion Mount Everest, right? It was like symbolic, right? I just to add, I paid for Reinhold's speech four thousand euros, four thousand euros for that speech in Garmisch. We generated during those four years, we generated above budget, above plan. I received one point one billion US dollars. So. 4,000 euros, 1.1 billion. And obviously, now I talk about the money. I'm not talking about the huge mental shift in the brain. That was even more important than, than the money. But this is it. You can inspire people by somebody else. I mean, Reinhold basically was able to tell them my story. You know what I mean, right? The story that we should not give up and we should yeah. really aim high. So, guys, this is it. And let's. there are already some questions, I think. Uh, there, there's a one question. Uh, in terms of smoker, when did he get confidence that you are ready and willing to work independently? <laughs> <laughs> so, this guy, um, God rest his soul, because he, he smoked quite a lot. I fear he's no longer with us, but he died happy, I'm quite sure. Okay. Um, very early in the piece, because he was, I think, um, someone who was maybe he was inspired in his past i don't know or maybe he wasn't inspired in his past but it was very strong within him to inspire whoever he uh taught and he never said that to us but we just could tell from the moment i actually remember the first moment he came into the class we were terrified of him absolutely terrified he got control like that so he did he knew how to get control but then he inspired us he knew what control was. He knew how to do it as a technique. He knew how to motivate us right. by fear into behaving. But within the first lesson, and I think that was actually one of the things I remember him because we were frightened of him at the beginning. In about half an hour in, it was, I suppose, he said, right, I'm going to have a cigarette now. And out he went. And he knew he'd got us. He was very, very uh, assured because he'd done it so many times before. And he was complete. I think that's the point about you can't fake it. Remember we said that. He was so clearly and sincerely enthusiastic about the subject. And he so importantly, and this is important, wanted us to enjoy it as much as him. It wasn't, this is great, I love it, and you're all stupid school kids, you don't get it. Which, let's face it, we've all been there, right? <laughs> this was, I love this and I really want you to love it too, right? And there was a sort of take it or leave it attitude. Out he went. And that was kind of the test. We didn't <laughs> want to let him down. When he came back in, we were good as a goal. Yeah. Uh, Jan Palacic is asking that uh, being one of who understands that between all of the 22 years, all people who don't, is, who don't, I don't understand as much. The worst is trying to tell them those things they just don't understand. Maybe I'm not inspiring enough. I would say I worked for many years with uh, Isaac International. Those were people like... Uh, 20, 25 at that time, 25 years younger than me. And, and I think you need to understand this generation, what is really inspiring them, because it's it's a bit different from uh, our generation. And one thing which Richard mentioned, 
this gen that generation, I mean, first of all, they understand technology much better than our generation. Okay, that's clear. And because of that, they are much more interested in experience as opposed on mm. ownership. So mm. if you will offer them, you know, some experience, for example, uh, you know, some offside meetings with very, you know, interesting people or interesting environment, I think it can inspire them and you can basically uh, deliver that message. And today I'm working with many, uh, you know, athletes and even YouTubers like 22 years uh, old. And you can understand them because if you you know listen to them and you 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 spend some time with them, how they think, what they do, and so on, and what they enjoy, uh, right? Then you can understand them. Edward Barsa is asking, which is quite an interesting question. Uh, that you know to know yourself, it's fundamental. You need to uh, know yourself. But uh, he's saying so. You should, but it, that it's not enough. That you should maybe go weekly to experience psychiatrists. That would make sense for getting a better leaders, isn't it? I would say that, you know, like working with psychologists or even psych psychiatrists, it's quite normal in United States. It's not yet normal in Europe. I mean, in UK, for example, I'm talking about my depression. I was, as you know, guys, at the, in mental hospital very openly, but in UK, it's not that, you know, open yet, right? I mean, I think society is open, but people are still not talking about it. And I, I believe that at some point it will be uh, uh, it will be quite normal. Because today people are visiting psychologists or psychiatrists once they have some issues. It's like with my some of my yeah. athletes when starting to when they started to work with me, they've got already some issues. I'm telling them it's not about the issues. Mental coaching is about to make sure that you deliver best performance in even in the tough situations, right? Right. It, because I think if you go there to, to see psychologists, psychiatrists, when you really need it, it's probably too late, right? I think, yeah, I think also that we sort of attach, uh, well, there's a stigma still in, in, in some places around mel mental illness, and it is an illness. Yeah. But I think yeah, also exactly. we're not all, you know, and, and that's wrong. But I think also we're not talking about illness here. I think all we're saying, or, or what was it, Victor? I'm sorry, I didn't get the name. But all, all I think is Victor being Franco. Said, Victor Franco. <laughs> Victor is, and I agree with you, is if I've got you right, which is it's simply about isn't it useful to have a mirror held up to us sometimes in order to gain awareness? Exactly. That's actually not about mental illness, uh, although there's nothing wrong with going to see some of a mental illness, illness either. But this is simply about being the best you can possibly be. Exactly. And there's nothing better. Remember what we said about 360s and actually using what you hear from a 360. Well, if you see a therapist, a coach, a good coach, whatever it is, hold a mirror up, it reflects back to you. And yes, you're absolutely right. I agree. It just helps you be the best you can be. So whether you call it a therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, whatever it is, yes, or a 360 from your own people, having that mirror reflected back at you is very, very healthy, very healthy. Yeah. 360, I don't know if everybody on the, you know, on this uh, broadcast, understand what is 360. 360 is the way you are getting feedback, basically, from your peers, people on the same level, from your bosses, and from your direct reports or the people below. It's really like 360 degrees feedback, and it goes like philosophically around three basic questions. What I'm doing well, what I'm not doing well, what should I stop to do? What should I, you know, continue to do what I'm doing well? Do better. What I'm not doing well, what should I do better? And what should I start to do, basically? Because there are things you may not do and you should do them, okay? Lubomir is asking, what is the maximal time leader can inspire a team? It depends on the uh, strengths of the vision. If the vision is like, we are going to, to change the world, you know, right? Like what Google is saying, like because of the information, we are going to change the world. Or, for example, Bill Gates, because, you know, Bill Gates' vision, the first vision to make him really uh, very famous was the vision uh, computer at every desk. And he said that vision, you know, when the smallest computer was in the room, like 40 square meters. OK, so it was like crazy, absolutely crazy. But majority of the people afterwards started to believe in what he believed and then it, it became reality so i think it, it really depends what, what kind of the organization and what is what is the vision like you know so what do we, but i think it's 
it, it's also just a, I think it's a mindset. It's, I, I think it's infinite. I mean, if you take uh, my wonderful teacher, just an example, uh, he spent his life inspiring thousands of students because it was just the way he did it and the way he lived and the way he was. So yes, there are individual projects where you can inspire people for a certain amount of time or a certain project, but it's, it's a mindset. Um, and I, I think it's infinite. It's a way of being. I, I, I believe that you need to create vision, but you need to create also environment. I, I, I explain you. When I joined Microsoft, there was a vision. It was clear. I mean, and Bill Gates was like God for, you know, Microsoft employees. Right? But he created an environment where all employees, including, you know, admin assistant, they were getting stock options, okay, which meant, mm -hmm. That if there was a, that you got like some salary, some bonus, whatever, but there was a huge upside in case Microsoft is successful and it was very successful first 10 years yeah. I was there. That, you know, even lady, like being, you know, admin assistant was able to gain, you know, a lot of money and be part of that success. And I think it, it was kind of the, there was a vision, so there was an inspiration, but also, okay, there's a, you know, uh, money associated with that, right? Because obviously, young people they would need to pay for housing and all of all of all of that stuff. That was the other thing. That was the other thing. But I would say it was like hygienic factor. This one, but what's really good, it was a learning environment. You could learn. And Bill Gates was hiring best people from the industry. Yeah. Right. If you if you were hired, okay, it meant like you are probably best in marketing in UK. You know, right? Or on or in support uh, somewhere else and so on. Now, basically, once the organization is bigger and bigger, you hire also some people who then you need to fire. But at the beginning, <laughs> at, the, at the beginning, he was really we were very careful with with hiring. It was hiring top people, and you are learning from the top people, and you feel like that uh, great organization. The other thing, which is quite interesting, and there are not that many cases, I must say. If you take like value of Microsoft brand and value of Bill Gates name brand, Bill mm. Gates name is higher. If you take, for example, mm. LinkedIn, Microsoft would have probably like 10 million followers or 11 million. You, you can check it, guys. But Bill Gates got a double of followers mm. on LinkedIn. Mm. Okay. Mm. And that's quite unique, right? Because if you have a leader like that, inspiration leader like that, you can also, mm. you, it's, it was a door opener with the customers. I will be very honest with you. And they are not, obviously, it was also Steve Jobs. It's probably uh, the, the guy from Tesla. What is his name? Elon Musk. Elon you Musk. know, right? Uh, yeah. And et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Miroslav Lichko is asking some question. I don't understand. What is it? Is it <laughs> please possible to recognize if the team you are part of is the cause? Is the cost. Cause, cause. Cause. Cause, yeah. Of what? Or cause of, I don't know. He, he didn't put it there. Cause of, you know, success or I don't know. Miroslav, if you're still there, if you can go like in more details, that would be helpful if, so we can. If, if I'm going to, maybe what we're talking about here is reward and recognition. And maybe I've got it wrong and I'm messed up. I'm sorry be, if I have. Yeah. But if, if that's what you're saying, I couldn't agree with you more in that it's celebrating the success of the team and it doesn't have to be money. And of course, it's the people who deliver through there. And remember what we said about inspiration being not just downwards, but sideways and upwards. And teams can inspire their leaders as much as anything else. But it's very important that we recognize rather than just reward mm -hmm. that kind of behavior. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your comment, but if, if I agree with you, if that's what you're saying. The, the one thing, Richard, we didn't touch that much, much is basically the energy, right? Because I'm, I think mm. in in the past, CEO meant chief executive officer. Okay, you would need to really execute, be like a motivational leader, motivational manager, whatever, right? Today, if we, it's about inspiration, I believe that you need to be much more chief enthusiasm officer and that enthusiasm <laughs> means energy and inspiration we yeah. talk a lot about inspiration let's talk about the energy i believe that if you as a leader are full of the energy you can inject that energy in the team 
but also that team can give you energy back because you are inspired by some eggs, by some activities, what they do, right? And remember, you agree that we, with me? I completely agree, and I also yeah. agree that with, with uh, completely, it's a positive energy inspiration. Right, exactly. Whereas what we said earlier, motivation can be a negative energy because it reduces everything to a contract, a quid right. pro quo. And when you get that unhealthy competition, competition can be good, but where you just reward people financially for doing something, that's that can be a very negative energy in a team. And inspiration, by definition, is a positive energy. It's in spirit, as you said, yeah. and it's infectious, as we said. So, yeah, energy is, is what it's all about. Perfect. Okay, so, Richard, thanks so much. <laughs> it was a great discussion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear friend, thanks for being with us. We will obviously continue. We will let you know uh, when and what uh, uh, what will be the, uh, the next team. Uh, uh, wish you all the best. I think it is nine o'clock in London, ten o'clock uh, in Prague. So it will be also good night <laughs> very, very soon. Hopefully the things are getting better now with COVID. So we'll be able to travel, you know, and uh, have some good uh, rest and some, you know, vacation. So thanks very much and uh, see you soon again, guys. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.